Boom Supersonic wants to bring back commercial supersonic aviation. The company now has a new supersonic test aircraft. And the amazing thing is that during the first test flights, you simply couldn't hear a supersonic boom. A new approach solves what is perhaps the biggest problem in supersonic aviation, meaning we could fly from Europe to the US again in just three and a half hours by 2030. How Boom solves the problem, who wants to buy the new planes now, and why supersonic planes might even have a positive effect on the climate. That's what we're going to talk about now. And with that, welcome to the German Science Guy. My name is Dr. Jakob Otton, and it's a pleasure to have you here. And in Germany, we say, los geht's. Supersonic across the Atlantic. This was first achieved in a scheduled flight in 1976 with a Concorde. The aircraft flew faster than Mach 2 or Mach 2, how you say it in English. But after all, Mach is named after the Austrian scientist Ernst Waldfried Josef Wenzel Mach. So I think you could also say Mach. But that was just a little thought I had while writing the script. So Mach 2 is simply almost 2,500 kilometers per hour. This meant that Concorde only took half as long to fly from London to New York as a conventional airplane. However, due to high costs, environmental problems, low capacity and extreme noise emissions, only a few aircraft were built. A serious accident in 2000 heralded the end of commercial supersonic aviation. The Boom Supersonic Company is now planning a comeback for 2030 and wants to do it a lot better this time. Their new XB-1 test aircraft has already demonstrated this. Flying without a sonic boom you can hear on ground. This is possible. But how did they achieve this and why is the noise issue in particular so important? Because supersonic flights are so loud, they are banned in many countries. The USA, for example, has had a ban on them since 1973. However, this only applies to civilian aircrafts. In Germany, supersonic flights are regulated in the air traffic regulations. Here, supersonic flights are permitted, but they must not cause a significant noise pollution to the public. In practice, this means that they can usually only take place over oceans or uninhibited areas, which brings the whole thing very close to a ban. But what is actually happening there? Sound always travels in waves. The particles in the air collide with each other and the sound is passed on in the same direction. How loud the sound is on the amplitude means the maximum distance the particles are deflected from the starting position during oscillation. The greater the amplitude, the louder the sound is perceived. This is also important for the sonic boom because when an airplane flies through the air, it pushes the air in front of it out of the way. This creates sound waves all the time. These sound waves move with the air at the speed of the sound in the direction in which they were pushed away from the aircraft. But the faster the airplane flies, the closer the sound waves are pressed together. And if you break it down very simply, you can say that the closer the sound waves are compressed, the higher the amplitude. If the aircraft now breaks through the sound barrier, the sound waves are so close together that they overlap and combine to form strong shock waves, which is why the amplitude and therefore also the volume is much higher than with normal sound waves. This is exactly what we hear as a loud sonic boom. And always twice in succession. This is due to the differences in pressure between the individual sound waves. But very importantly, shock waves are created all the time and that's why there are actually banks all the time. You might ask yourself, why exactly do you hear the bang twice? Well, the air is compressed in front of the aircraft. This creates the first sonic boom. At the end of the aircraft, however, this buildup pressure drops abruptly so that it is lower than the pressure level of the surrounding air. With the second bang, the air pressure suddenly returns to exactly this level. A special signature can be seen on measuring instruments, namely an N shape. So there's a bang the whole time, but we hear it twice, once because pressure builds up in front of the aircraft and once because the air pressure returns to the ambient level. Such a sonic boom can quickly reach a perceived volume of 110 decibels on the ground. And just for comparison, 110 decibels is about as much as in a very loud club. And such a volume can quickly cause hearing damage. However, Boom Supersonic says that this problem can be solved and they now demonstrated this with their XB-1 test aircraft. XB-1 is a smaller scale version of the Overture design, approximately one to three scale. 
Overture will later become the large commercial aircraft that will be used for passenger flights in the future. You have to imagine the test aircraft is a flying laboratory and this laboratory takes measurements for the Overture design all the time. Almost 10 kilometers of cable were laid in the XP-1 for this purpose alone. XP-1 is largely made of carbon fiber reinforced plastic. This makes the aircraft particularly light, but also very stable. However, Boom has worked a lot with titanium and special metal alloys, especially around the engines. Titanium not only withstands a lot of heat, but with a density of just 4.5 kilograms per cubic decimeter, it is also really light compared to other metals. Stainless steel, on the other hand, for example, has a density of 7.9 kilograms per cubic decimeter, so almost twice as much. Overall, the XP-1 uses a lot of well thought out technology, for example, the turbines or the air intakes or the cockpit with augmented reality. And Boom uses a special effect for the sonic boom, namely the Mach cutoff phenomenon. This is supposed to make the sonic boom inaudible to us on the ground. But how does it work? This is really interesting. The Mach cutoff phenomenon is based on the fact that the speed of sound depends on the temperature. There are strong temperature differences in the atmosphere, especially in the lowest layer. This is a troposphere. This is the layer of the atmosphere in which we live in, and it extends from the ground to about 7 to 17 kilometers upwards. It depends a bit on where you are on Earth. Here on the ground it's relatively warm, let's say 15 degrees Celsius on average. But the further up we go in the troposphere, the colder the air becomes. At the uppermost edge it has a temperature of minus 50 to minus 80 degrees Celsius. Due to the low temperatures, further up the air is less dense and a lower density reduces the speed of sound. This means that the speed of sound is slower high up in the troposphere than here on the ground. While the speed of sound at sea level is 1225 kilometers per hour, at an altitude of 11 kilometers at minus 50 degrees Celsius, it is only 1078 kilometers per hour. So let's imagine a sound wave. It travels from an aircraft at an altitude of 11 kilometers towards the ground. It passes through many layers of air in the troposphere. Each new layer of air is a little warmer and so the sound wave gets faster and faster. And this is where it gets exciting because the sound wave reaches a kind of checkpoint with each layer of air. In other words, the wave does not move continuously from the aircraft to the ground, but from checkpoint to checkpoint and a new wave begins with each checkpoint. However, with each checkpoint, so with each layer of air, the angle changes slightly and with that the direction in which the sound travels. This is due to the so-called Huygens principle or, I looked it up, it should be called Huygens principle because he was Dutch. The layers of air become warmer and warmer from top to bottom and therefore the sound also becomes faster and faster. And if the wave propagates at different speeds in two substances, the wave is refracted and the angle of propagation changes. So you can imagine it like a prism. So the layers of air work in a similar way to a prism that refracts light only in the case that the layers of air do not reflect light, but sound. This then leads to the Mach cutoff phenomenon. With each layer of air, the angle now turns further and further until the sound no longer propagates towards the ground, but upwards again. As a result, the sonic boom can only be heard up to the heights at which the sound waves bends upwards again. It's a pretty cool phenomenon. However, this has a few restrictions, which brings me directly to my big butt, but beforehand, why don't you subscribe and activate the bell so that you don't miss any more videos and you support my channel. So let's come to my big but today. There are a few relevant limitations. This is because earlier models and theories on the Mach cutoff phenomenon often do not take sufficient account of atmospheric effects such as vertical winds and sometimes the temperature profiles of these air layers are even more complex. The atmosphere is simply super variable and the wind and temperature changes, which are actually difficult to predict, make it difficult to control such a Mach cutoff phenomenon. There's also hardly any empirical data to date. More research simply needs to be done. And what you also have to consider, according to current knowledge, this phenomenon only works at a certain speed, namely between Mach 1 and Mach 1.15. That's around 1235 to 1420 kilometers per hour. This means that if we fly faster, we will still hear the bang. We then need legal speed limits to ensure that nobody flies faster. But due to all the uncertainties surrounding Mach cutoff flights, there are still no clear legal requirements. 
For the time being, you have to go with what is there and real commercial supersonic flights would probably only be permitted over the sea for the time being. There are also climate concerns. The International Council on Clean Transportation, for example, says a commercial supersonic aircraft could use five to seven times as much fuel per passenger as a normal commercial aircraft, which would not only be quite expensive and consume a lot of raw materials, but is of course also not good for our planet. Or maybe it is. This is where it gets really interesting. A study by MIT has also taken a closer look at the whole thing. According to the study, modern supersonic aircraft could even lead to a cooling of climate. This is due to the sulfur emissions from the aircraft. Sulfur reacts with the humidity in the atmosphere and forms sulfuric acid. This results in a formation of small sulfured particles, which then float in the atmosphere and reflect some of the sun rays. It's like large volcanic eruptions, which can also cool the climate through this effect. However, sulfur emissions also increase ozone reduction, which is not so great. In principle, sulfur-free fuels could solve this problem, but that would also increase global warming again, of course, so as you can see, this is a rather complex issue. Especially as it has to be said that there are also studies that show that emissions high up in the air further increase the effect of greenhouse gases. So I would be very careful with this point, but we will see what future research says about it. Well, Supersonic is definitely working on it. The company is currently still testing the XP-1. By 2030, however, the company aims to have its first commercial supersonic aircraft overture in the air. According to Boom, there are already several interested parties for the aircraft. American Airlines and United have already paid a deposit for 35 aircrafts. And with these new aircrafts, flights between Frankfurt and New York should be almost 50% faster. But of course, we will have to see how it develops. When Overture is presented, you will of course be informed here on the channel, so make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any more videos. Until then, you can watch more of my videos. you find one here, right here. Okay, in Germany, we say Auf Wiedersehen, macht's gut, goodbye.